Guys, how we doing? Welcome to Good Works Tractors. Got a good one for you today. 10 more random tractor questions. This might be the best batch yet. You guys are doing pretty good asking those questions. Some I know the answer, some I don't, some I gotta research, but it makes it a lot of fun either way. Right behind me here, it's gonna be the first question but it's gonna be the last one to answer. It's gonna take a while for us to get through that. It has something to do with those buckets way up in the air, so stick around and see what that's all about. If you enjoyed the video, would you give me a thumbs up? Hit that button right down below. There's a subscribe button right next to it as well. If you haven't done so yet, I'd encourage you to do so and read through that description right underneath the video if you're in the market for a tractor or a cool tractor attachment. First question today is a pretty good one. An interesting one, I don't know the answer to, but we're gonna find out. It's gonna be a part A, part B. So part A now, part B at the end of the video when we come back and do some final measurements. Let's talk about loader drift down. You could be talking about a backhoe as well, but what is an acceptable amount of drift? How much will your loader drift? And why don't you wanna have your loader up in the air? I think you'll find that out pretty quick. Now, funny enough, years ago, I actually had a 4105 parked inside the shop and I was trying to save as much space as I possibly could. Had the loaders raised up above the ROPS bar. They were kind of stacked in there. Had the, the ROPS bar right underneath here and the loader resting right on top of it with a bucket. Lo and behold, I didn't secure the bucket to the, to the loader frame. It was just resting there. I totally forgot. I forgot all about it. And came back out the next day and it was all cockeyed. The bucket almost completely came off of the loader. Fortunately, it was actually a skid steer quick attach, not a John Deere quick attach, and the way that it was jammed in there didn't allow the entire bucket to fall off. Otherwise, it would have smashed right on whatever tractor was in front of it. Do you remember that, Chris? You were here. <laughs> you actually helped me get that back up on there. You don't remember that? Yeah, yeah. So it was a summer day. I looked for the pictures. I couldn't find any pictures of it, but it was a pretty scary situation to have potentially a five or 600 pounds, 72 inch wide, skid steer quick attach construction bucket uh, hanging up there barely holding on so a customer recently said their john deere dealer told them an allowable amount of drift down is four inches in an hour so i'm curious just to see how much these drift down i'm sure there's a lot of variables that go into configuring or, or determining that amount you know maybe temperature maybe if it's new or if it's old if it has a bucket or if it has nothing on there, all sorts of variables. But we're working with what we have here, so I am curious to find out, maybe you are too. An easy experiment for you to do at home as well. All right, I don't really know a great point to measure these at, but we're gonna do this Zerk fitting that's kinda at the base of the carrier bracket uh, on both of these loaders. And for good measure, we have a John Deere backhoe back on the 4105, so we're gonna take a measurement on that. We'll give you that info too. This is not scientific, so I don't wanna hear about that from all the scientists out there. 69 inches center line. 102 and a half inches. Yeah, let's pick this point here to measure uh, and drift down on the backhoe. Yeah, it looks like about 45 inches to the center line. Close enough. A viewer recently asked, can my 1025R pull my truck up this hill? Well, I don't know, I've never done that. But I figured, what better time to find out than right now? I have no idea if this is practical or not. I've got duels on my tractor as well, so that's gonna influence it. I'm gonna put it in four-wheel drive, locking rear differential, I know you guys like that, and we'll see what happens. So I don't know if this makes any sense or not. Maybe you could picture this being a trailer instead of a truck that it's hauling, or you know, maybe you have a gator stuck down by the lake and you have to haul that out. Just use your imagination. It's just a data point. Let's see if it does it. Got my Super Duty crew cab here, Power Stroke diesel, all that stuff. So I don't know how much it weighs. I think it's somewhere around the 8,000 pound uh, curb weight, give or take. It really doesn't matter. It's a lot of weight either way. I'm not really convinced it's going to haul it up this hill, but I'm ready to find out. Oh, by the way, I'm doing this because a viewer asked. I don't know if I mentioned that or not, but I go above and beyond to answer my viewer's question.
Well, how about that? I did not think that was going to happen right there, but that made it up. I just had a great idea. Gooseneck F-250. This was easy. Let's see about that. Okay, I did not think this 1025 was going to pull that F-350 up this hill. It did it without even straining at all. So, got the 250 now, the gooseneck, and some snow. Oh, and I forgot to mention, we got Morgan sitting inside the cab as well. So, we're gonna take guesses here. I'm gonna say, no, I'm gonna save mine for last. Chris, is it gonna pull it up the hill? Yes. Wow, okay. Going, yeah. Yes? I'm going, there's no way this 1025 hour is pulling this setup up the hill. But, I would've said the same thing about that F-350. Let's find out. We're gonna give this a little bit of a fighting chance. I'm, I'm gonna have Morgan drive forward through the snow. That way it's, it's a pack down run and no additional resistance there, okay? So let's, let's give it a shot. After we got that snow cleared out of the way, we drove forward and then backwards just to give it a hard pack, you know, instead of having that extra resistance. And uh, sure enough, it started to strain. You could definitely hear it straining, but it pulled it the entire way up here. I'm shocked. I think, if I remember right, that trailer weighs another 4,000, maybe 4,500 pounds, so maybe 5,000, just say four to 5,000 pounds. That's a lot of weight for this little tractor, even though it is rolling weight. I totally get that, but it's still a data point for you to keep in mind. That's pretty sweet. A little 1025R, isn't that cool? Cab please, common question, especially when there's snow on the ground. Where can I get a cab for my tractor or my Gator, my UTV, ATV, whatever. Mainly tractors though. Obviously the OEM, the factory cab, you gotta buy it with your tractor, you know, but if you have an open station machine, there are some options out there to add on an aftermarket cab. These do range from very affordable to as expensive as an OEM cab. The downside with all of these cabs, except for one exception, is that they don't come with air conditioning, but heat is typically an available option. So the first thing you think about with a cab is staying nice and warm on those cold winter days. It's gonna motivate you to get your work done more frequently, more efficiently, and even on rainy days as well, if you can be inside a cab and not getting soaking wet, that's gonna make things more enjoyable too. Without further ado, I took a little bit of time and compiled a list of all the cab manufacturers I could find or that I've had here that have been on tractors that I've seen firsthand as well. Some I have not. I think this is almost in alphabetical order as well. The first one is Agritol. They may be an international company. I'm not sure if you have to ship them in here or not. Then you have Cozy Cabs, Curtis Cabs, Mauser Cabs, Seismic Cabs, Sims Cabs, and Tektite Cabs. So a lot of options out there from soft enclosures to hard-sided um, steel cabs, a lot of glass, real fancy, a lot of options that are inside. One of the things, the downsides that I think about aftermarket cabs are a lot of them are very noisy. They're like big rattle boxes, especially the steel ones without any kind of padding or noise reduction on the inside. You may want to look into that. Now that's a lot of information. There is going to be information down in the description underneath the video as well. So you can kind of reference that if you're trying to go through and see which manufacturers offer a cab solution for you. We'll put links down in the description as well so you can go right to their websites, check out what they have. Maybe they don't have something for you, maybe they do. On the opposite hand, if you're looking for something to keep you out of the sun on those hot summer days, I encourage you to check out the Rhino Hide Canopy, an indestructible solution in what, the last six years did he say? He's never had a single one returned? That's a pretty good track record. Oh yeah, and I forgot the best part about that, well maybe being indestructible is the best part, but you also get 5% off with code GWT. Go to Rhino Hide, link down below to place your order. Good question from a lot of folks actually. I hate when I get questions that I don't have a very good answer for, but unfortunately this is one of those questions and it's how long is that edge going to last? You know, whether it's a steel edge, could be a rubber, could be a UHMW, the material doesn't matter so much, but that's really dependent on how often and how much you're using the plow, the pusher, the snowblower, even the bucket edge. The more you're using it, the faster it's going to wear, 
you know, that's pretty obvious. So if you have a really easy winter or if you're only doing your driveway and it's a very small driveway, if you have a thousand foot drive, if you're doing it commercially, you see where I'm going. It's very hard to pinpoint how long the material, the edge is gonna last. Also, depending on how thick it is, you know, it could be really thin. Certain materials will last longer than other materials. So steel will typically last the longest with UHMW not too far behind it, while rubber is gonna protect the most but we're the fastest. Now, a couple pieces of advice is typically the thicker the material, the longer it's going to last, as well as the height of the material. And a good way to take advantage of a taller, taller meaning up and down section of material would be to get something that you can flip over. So you can use this side here, and then once that wears down, you can flip it over and use this side as well. So that's gonna give you a lot more bang for your buck. So I've got our thinner material right here. And I'm gonna be honest, this is actually thicker than what a lot of the competition has. So this is three quarter uh, inches thick right here. And a lot of folks are gonna use either a 0.5 or a 0.6 thickness on um, UHMW for things like smaller snow plows, could be for your ATVs, your, your UTVs, those types of plows. I went a little bit thicker just because I felt like you wanna get more bang for your buck. And same thing can be said for this thicker material, which is typically used for the you know, the bigger, bigger snow pushers and for bigger, heavier duty plows, other applications along those lines. So when you're looking for an edge, it's gonna be very challenging for anybody to give a legitimate answer on how long the material is going to last. But the bigger, the beefier that you go, maybe the taller that you go, the longer it's gonna last. And I think we know my pick is gonna be the UHMW. We sum it up by saying it protects like rubber, but it cuts like steel. Don't take my word for it though. If you've bought a piece of this from me or you've been using it for a long time, I'd love to get your feedback. Leave a comment down below. <laughs> Common question, good question too, this next one here, but will a local dealer service your tractor or honor the warranty if you buy it from me or somewhere else, if you don't buy it new, if you don't buy it from them? So this is a question that my answer would be, any good quality dealer is going to service or honor the warranty even if you didn't buy it from them. And I think that's twofold. Number one, it's gonna tell you a whole lot about that dealer and their reputation if they are so concerned about selling you the equipment over taking care of their customers. So number two, these businesses are set up, but hang on, I am not a John Deere or Kubota dealer. I don't actually service equipment, but this is my take on it, my interpretation. I do run a business, so I, I feel like I have at least a little insight to how it works. But they're set up to have different profit centers. So sales is only one profit center, but parts and service, you know, attachments, all those kinds of other areas, maybe insurance or financing, those are different profit centers, how they can make profit at the end of the day and be successful. So service and parts are gonna be sometimes more profitable than just selling the tractor or the skid steer or the gator, whatever it is outright in the beginning. And plus they're establishing a relationship with you, the customer, or maybe they already have a relationship where you're gonna come back to them for the little $100 accessory here, or maybe a $5,000 attachment there, that kind of thing, all down the road. So if your local dealer won't service your equipment or honor a warranty just because you didn't buy a piece of equipment from them, I'd look elsewhere. You know, I'm telling you, it's just a slew of good questions for this video. How much is my tractor worth, or how much should I pay for that tractor? Well, the simple answer is, however much you're willing to buy it for or sell it for. Unfortunately, there's not a blue book, a NADA, no kind of tractor guide to tell you how much this option, that option is worth the year, the hours, the configuration, but I don't really like those guides anyways. If you're like me, you never like that number that Kelly Blue Book spits out anyway. My vehicle's always worth more than what it has to say, but that's the number that a buyer's gonna look at if they're coming to me trying to make an offer. Before I sold tractors, I bought and sold a whole lot of boats, and it was a good starting point because you can look up on the NADA guides the average values for a boat with all sorts of accessories. However, I often paid more than the Blue Book value and sold them for way more than the Blue Book value. So it was really just a starting point, maybe a negotiation tactic if you're looking to buy one and, and you don't really know where to start. However, it's really based on supply and demand condition of it. So regardless of what you're shopping for, if you're looking to buy it or sell it, you gotta get a feel for the market. Spend a couple of days looking at different websites, what things are selling for, what they're being listed for. See if you can see how long it's been listed for. If you go to a big place like an auto trader or tractor house, you know, or boat trader, any, any place, no matter what it is you're trying to sell, just sort them from cheapest to most expensive. You know, if it's all 1025 R's, there might be 300 of these for sale on tractor house. I can tell you this right now, if they're all set up with the loader and a mower, 
75% of those are never moving. You know, the, that cheapest, that bottom 25%, those are the tractors that are gonna be sold with a rare exception here or there, but don't pay any attention to the stuff that's, you know, priced four or $5,000 more than anybody would ever pay. So it's not a straightforward answer, and I don't have the answer for you because it's gonna come down at the end of the day to what you're willing to pay for it, what you're willing to sell for it, and whoever you're dealing with on the other end of that transaction. Common question, but a good question too, but the quick attach, the John Deere quick attach, and this goes for skid steer quick attach as well, but something on a 4066R, is it gonna fit the same as on a little 1025R? Isn't it gonna be like wider or taller or further apart or something where it's just not gonna be compatible? Well, that's the beauty of a standardized system is that you could take an attachment from a 1025R, put it on a 4066R as long as you have a John Deere quick attach or vice versa. But do you really wanna do that? So as you can see, John Deere 4R, little 1025R, same carrier brackets for the John Deere Quick Attach. You can see the spacing is identical. Up and down, the size is identical as well. So this is not a problem. You can take an attachment from a smaller tractor if you're upsizing, maybe not from a 1025 to a 4 series, but maybe from a 1 to a 2 series or a 2 to a 3 series perhaps, or a 3 to a 4, you get the idea. Let's see what it looks like though if you put something from a 4 series onto a 1 series. <laughs> So I don't know if you caught that or not when I was hooking up to this pusher right here, but this is a good example of just because you could doesn't mean you should, but check this out. There is no weight on the back end of this tractor. There is a lot of weight on that front axle there. I've only got it just a couple inches off the ground, but you can see I'm just standing here shoving this thing around. It's pretty incredible. Oh, also another reason why you always want to have plenty of ballast weight on the back end of your machine. Can I add this to this? If you don't know what this and this are, we're talking about a hydraulic multiplier and a power beyond circuit on your tractor. A hydraulic multiplier is a relatively inexpensive way to get a lot of additional hydraulic circuits on your tractor. What you see here on my 4066R is hooked into either the third, the fourth, or the fifth function, take your pick. You only need one of those functions, but then I get five additional circuits, you can get them with just one or two or three or four additional circuits as well. But notice I don't have it plugged into a Power Beyond hydraulic connection. Power Beyond is what's needed to run a backhoe on your tractor, or if you think about it in different contexts, you're gonna plug hydraulic hoses into your tractor and then the backhoe has the controls on there that make those cylinders actuate. So the difference with Power Beyond is the fact that there's no controls there versus a regular hydraulic circuit that would have a thumb control or a lever somewhere mounted on the tractor to open and close the valve and direct flow. When you have something plugged into your power beyond, the flow is just gonna go through it until it can't go anymore. It's just, it's just gonna stop eventually, otherwise it'll just keep flowing right through. So you need to have a two-way valve installed between your power beyond and the hydraulic coupler. So you can use that hydraulic coupler, but there's an extra step involved. But if you already have Power Beyond on your tractor, you'd have to basically get two things then. That actual two-way valve or lever, maybe mount it somewhere up here, get some hoses and connect, and then you can mount that multiplier as well. But you can't just take a multiplier and plug it right into Power Beyond. It's not gonna work that way. Being wintertime and using snow blowers, this question comes up a lot, but folks ask me, my snow blower keeps shutting off when I go backwards. Is there a way to keep that from happening? Now there's two ways you can overcome that obstacle, and one of these even applies to using a mower deck as well. If you're trying to back up with it engaged, safety first. There's a workaround though. Now the right way, if you have a John Deere front-mounted snowblower for your tractor, is that it should come with something called an RIO cable and sensor. And what that does is it hooks up into a harness that's already on your tractor. It ties into a little sensor that's up front here with your snowblower contraption and so when you go backwards it's going to be an override and not kill the tractor or the PTO and turn the snowblower off. Now if yours did not come with that sensor or that cable you can always pick it up from your John Deere dealer. It's probably not too expensive although it's probably more than I would venture to guess but it's going to be a little bit more convenient than the second way I'm about to share with you now. The second way is actually built in as part of your tractor and it's going to be tied into the button or the knob that's going to turn your PTO on and off to begin with. But for me personally, I don't really find this to be a big deal at all. I use it all the time with a mower deck all summer long, so some people can just live with it forever. 
But what you can do, you would turn your mower deck on just like this or your snow blower, and this is the on position after you pull up. But notice, it's got a little give in there. And so that is a built-in override. And so if you pull up on this before you hit the reverse pedal, and then you press the reverse pedal, you can let go, and it's not gonna kill that snow blower as you back up or the mower deck. You go forward just like normal. If you hit reverse again, it's going to kill the machine. So every time you back up, just pull a little bit before you hit reverse, you're gonna be good to go. What kind of diesel can you put in your tractor? You can put the same stuff that you put in your truck, that's no big deal. If you can get your hands on some farm diesel, that's gonna be a little bit cheaper, typically lower taxes on that. But just make sure if you go that route of the farm diesel that you don't end up putting that into your truck because that's a big no-no, you could get fined for that. It's a good thing to keep some extra diesel on hand, but it's also important to note that they're gonna change the composition of it between winter and summer. So in the summertime, it's gonna be a little bit higher octane. Come wintertime, they're gonna put a little bit, almost like an anti-gel in there, that way they can lower the gelling point of the diesel, make it work better in your tractor, that is going to lower the cetane value. However, if you're still burning through that summertime diesel, you don't just wanna store it all winter long, just get yourself some anti-gel to add in there, or if it's sitting outside and you wanna make sure really cold temperatures are coming, I need my tractor to start, just put some of this in your fuel system. Loop shuttle, you get 5% off with code GWT. Okay, it's been an hour, 60 minutes. Grab some measurements, we'll see how they compare. So this one started out at 69 inches, I think it was. We are now at 68 and a half inches. Ballpark. Okay, so now the H165 loader. Keep in mind, this is the John Deere 4105 tractor. 102 inches, maybe 102 and an eighth at the most. I think we started out at 102 and a half. So let's move to a fraction of an inch. Not too bad. Let's check that back out. Okay, if we measure, we're at 43 and a half. I think we we're at 45 originally. So this the backhoe dropped about an inch and a half, the most out of all three. So I find that to be pretty interesting. These aren't really moving that much just in an hour. However, if you multiply even a half inch or an inch over the course of 24 hours, you're talking, you know, could be 24 inches potentially. So it could really add up. Now, if we talk about the backhoe, they pretty much always come with some sort of a, a restraint, whether it's a big bracket like this or maybe a rod that you put through uh, because they are known to leak down. This isn't just John Deere, it's just backhoes in general, but they're gonna drift down. And oftentimes if you have this parked up, you know, tight to the wall in your garage or maybe you have a car behind there or anything else, you come out a day or two later and you find this has drifted down and it's punched a hole in your wall or put a nice dent in the hood of your car or you know, whatever else. So it's something to keep in mind, whether it's a loader or a backhoe, could even be a mower deck, Things are gonna drift down over time. Well, there you go, folks. 10 more random tractor questions. Somebody said they're not random because I'm picking them, but they're random because they're just all over the board all about tractors. So I try not to think about things too hard. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this. Looking forward to compiling another list of 10 more questions down the road. If you do like what you saw here, I'd love to get a thumbs up from you. And if you haven't done so already, hit that subscribe button right down below. And as always, read through the description as well. All sorts of helpful links down there for tractor owners or head on over to goodworkstractors.com. Thanks so much for stopping by and until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon.